Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the May 11th, 2021 Open Planetary Lunch. My name is Chase Million. Thank you all for being here. Our speaker today is Davin Quinn from the University of Wisconsin talking about his uh, new map mapping software called Mapboard GIS. And this is Davin's second talk. So um, that's, that's, what I, that's what I call someone who's annoyingly prolific. So well done, uh, uh, Davin. And thank you for being here a second time. And when you're ready, just go ahead and begin speaking. Okay, well, um, yeah, thanks for having me here a second time. Uh, you know, I enjoy speaking to this group of forward looking people trying to solve things in new ways. So, um, you know, and this, I think, is a good example of, of trying to solve things in a fundamentally new way. And, uh, you know, we're at the stage where it kind of works for me and starting to try and figure out whether it can work for other people. Um, so, uh, yep. So this is actually a project that started really on Earth. So I am split a little bit between um, Earth mapping and planetary mapping. And the last time I talked to you guys was about planetary mapping. Um, but this is really a more broadly focused thing, which is just on the, the idea of an interpretive geologic map. And so this is kind of the height of the data products we have produced as geoscientists, um, you know, in terms of the information density and, um, and what it conveys about the geologic record. And so this is a, a super classic example of just the Grand Canyon, which conveys um, a lot of structural geologic information and also uh, information about the progression of geologic time. Uh, in, in a pretty colorful thing that geologists can understand and show off to uh, non-geologists as well. And so during my PhD, I did geologic mapping in two very different areas. Um, one was Southern Namibia, where the input data was really on the ground work, um, you know, marching up and down a plateau and collecting uh, bedding orientations and uh, assembling a geologic map kind of the old fashioned way. Um, another side of this was basically working in Northeast Sirtis Major Mars and peering down from orbit and trying to assemble the same information about geologic history of an area from a, uh, from a orbital vantage point, which is you know in some ways a much tougher problem. Um, but it's just a different problem. In one way you're data limited you know, you're looking down from above with limited idea what's going on. And in the other uh, extreme, you have way too much data that you have to filter down into something that's, uh, you know, kind of cohesive. And so the one kind of broad um, takeaway I, I was able to assemble from both of these very different mapping processes is that these maps are essentially models models of geologic process, um, you know, the deposition of, of the rocks and, and their uh, deformation um, and alteration through time. And so like any good model, the way to unpack them and um, kind of improve them is to basically check yourself, to do the uh, scientific process in miniature by basically creating a working model evaluating it against the data and then uh, building a better model. So for both of these maps, my preferred process was to essentially like redraft them over and over again as I kind of got a better and better geologic understanding of what was going on. And so where this app really started was with my earth side mapping in Namibia. Um, where basically I was mapping a fold and thrust belt with these really pretty um, small scale um, thrust faults and basal detachment faults and, and all sorts of good structural geology stuff. Um, and this area has been mapped uh, many times in the past and always by hand, of course. These, these are, um, the first map was in the 1940s, it was a seminal map for uh, a fold and thrust belt mapping. Um, and this is my kind of by hand rendition of its major, um, major takeaways in terms of uh, structure. And 
the hand-based process is really good, but we've got really good data. And then the question is, well, we can map a really small scale and uh, structures that are kind of at, you know, these are folds that we can kind of see in this, um, this really stunningly good at this point, uh, SRTM-based map with uh, draped imagery. Um, but we can see kind of 100 meter scale folds. Um, and uh, yet we are trying to map a plateau that is about 40 kilometers wide. So the question is like, what's the right scale to even approach this problem at? Um, and so the answer going in, uh, starting with kind of a paper-based field mapping workflow is that you just print out a ton of base maps so that you're able to map at a very fine scale. So, you know, I basically spent like $150 in printing, like really annoyed the campus printing shop and um, because I needed it like right before I left, of course, um, and then, you know, ended up with a ream of base maps that had boxes that are still pretty large. They're one kilometer on a side, uh, but there's 30 sheets here. Um, and then kind of every, you know, few days I drive around to a different side of the plateau, um, hike in, and then like spend a while taping a new base map to my uh, map board and marching off into the wilderness. Um, and then I'd, you know, kind of keep doing that over and over again. Now, the problem really arises that now we don't have, you know, a shop full of people to draft our maps for us, you know, that's kind of been lost to time. And, um, you know, especially on the academic side. And logic maps are going to end up as digital products anyway. So this is a, um, a kind of plug, a small plug for my current work at Macrostrat, which is on kind of global scale geologic maps of Earth. Um, but it's going to be a digital product. So how, do, how does it get there? And the answer, unfortunately, started off as me sitting in my tent after a day of mapping and basically clicking points in QGIS until my battery died. And um, also, I, I remember uh, the flight attendant on the flight back from Namibia asking what I was doing at some point because I had been like looking at the same screen and clicking points for like, you know, eight hours of flying time or something like that. And you, you know, you can get work done, but it's really, really slow. Um, and then the second problem that goes back to this kind of guess and check iterative philosophy that I outlined is that current digital workflows really don't quite cut it for iterative mapping. So what we want is kind of what we're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen, which is uh, to see the map as we're creating it, to be able to evaluate our scientific product as it's being built over the course of some you know, period of days or months and, um, and figure out what we need to attack next, you know, kind of uh, building it up as we go along. And what we actually get is what is on the right, which is just a series of dialog boxes in ArcGIS to uh, the, the workflow you're meant to use for making a, um, a topo topologically correct geologic map is basically to first digitize all your line work, then find the polygons that are inside that line work and, um, and use those to construct your units. And that means you can't see the digital product until you are finished with it, which is not a great way to, to um, go as a working process. And so that's part of why geologists have stuck with paper for so long. It's just like, it's the way you can really build the map up and see it as you go. So over the past few years, actually during kind of the period of my field work during my PhD, there have been a few different technological game changers that have allowed us to really conceive of a better way to do this. And so the first one is the iPad and the Apple Pencil, um, which basically showed up around 2016 and kind of immediately blew my mind and got my gears turning of like how I could use this in my mapping. Because basically it allowed you to bring the kind of pencil-based input method that's really quick on a paper field map to a digital realm in a way that's actually accessible more so than a Wacom tablet that I didn't have the money for as a grad student. Um, then the second game changer, which has kind of been a more slow cooking deal. So a lot of this um, kind of existed in the background as, as these new um, digitizing tools came online are 
open source GIS really um, building up into a really sophisticated uh, set of technologies. And in particular, I'm focusing here on PostGIS, um, which is the PostgreSQL extension for um, GIS, and Spatialite, which is its kind of uh, little cousin for the SQLite database, which is kind of more for embedded systems. Um, and then there are, of course, GIS systems that work really well with this, like QGIS. Um, and this is all, if you're not so familiar with this, it's kind of the vector cousins of kind of the GDAL based um, and PROJ and all of these libraries that we know and love in the planetary side for dealing with raster data. So this is, um, you know, the same kind of idea of like open foundational systems uh, for dealing with vector data. And in particular, especially because of investments of European governments that are interested in using this for um, kind of their, uh, their, uh, their urban planning mapping, it has really good support for uh, topology baked into these open source systems now. So lots of thanks to a large community there. Um, but basically, the, the, the use of these two systems has allowed us to, oh, this is a video it should play, um, has allowed us to basically roll these together into a new app for the iPad that basically uses the capabilities of, um, of the pen-based digitizer for natural editing, and then uses the capabilities of open source GIS for this topology awareness and being able to kind of construct the map iteratively as you go. And I think these two advances, which are separate, one of which depends on the capabilities of the iPad primarily, and the other of which depends on open source GIS, layered together provide us a fundamentally new way to build geologic maps. And so this map or GIS app is all about exploring that new approach. Um, and I think it has a lot to, um, a lot to offer. Uh, so this is a still preliminary version of the geologic map that I'm constructing um, in Namibia um, with this app. And so this was, um, there's still some lines in here that are kind of uh, straight point by point uh, plugged in through QGIS, but it's being reworked um, as time goes on to have more, uh, more hand-drawn lines and at a much uh, higher resolution. And that allows us to do things like looking back at these um, 100 meter scale folds and kind of layering in some of the uh, 3D geologic mapping uh, approaches that actually were the subject of my last open plan talk. We can kind of see the structure of the plateau emerge at this really fine scale um, because we're able to map at a really high scale over a really large area. Um, and so this is essentially a fully digital process for iteratively constructing a geologic map. And even though the map's not complete, we can still see it in its you know, uh, full, um, kind of as it's fully developed and, and build it over time. And, and so this is kind of the view of the map in this iPad app. And, and this is not all held in the iPad. This is uh, in collaboration with my laptop, which is why it's able to uh, you know, render such a large amount of ge geograph or geologic data uh, easily. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go stepwise and start kind of from the simplest to the most complex modes of using this app. So the simplest mode is basically for standalone mapping. And this is designed with the idea that like most geologists will want to use this kind of in field, in kind of field mode, just to like rapidly capture their information into the app. So basically the app stores its information on a spatial light database that can be easily read in QGIS and ArcGIS um, once you move it to a computer. So with that, I'm going to just shift over to a view of my iPad screen here, um, which basically is showing where I live um, on the isthmus in Madison, Wisconsin here um, in, in this app. So this is kind of your standard GIS interface. There's a little collapsible side panel. There's a move mode, a draw mode, an erase mode and a kind of select mode for more complicated GIS action. So what I really tried to do with this app was make it a very simple way of interacting with the GIS that is much like 
um, drawing on paper. Um, so it has some GIS niceties, like um, if you get it close enough, uh, the lines will snap together. Um, so yeah, there's some snapping that goes on here and stuff like that. But fundamentally, you can kind of draw things. You can draw as complex lines as you want. You can erase, and it will kind of erase naturally. Um, so on the app side, a lot of work went into basically building something that was kind of naturally to work with. And when I'm working on my complicated mapping, I'm often kind of sitting on my couch, kind of noodling with my iPad while some TV show plays in the background or something like that. Um, so that's kind of the first step here. Um, the next part of this is that we can actually go and enable a topology. So even on the kind of standalone mode, Spatialite has support for topology. And um, there's kind of an, an anemic topology engine on the device. So you can see here that it says it's working as I kind of close some line work into polygons. Um, and I think the reason it's working for a rather long time is there's some, some mapping elsewhere on this, uh, on this project that uh, is, is taking a while, which we'll zoom out and look for. Uh, but yes, this, this topology engine is relatively slow um, on the device, but um, it, kind of, it kind of does its thing. I thought I had deleted this. Yes, so it says 42 seconds, um, and that took a while. But um, we'll look out, kind of zoom out and look for the cause of that 42 second delay. Apparently, my internet is very slow here on this device. But oh, here's the cause is that, you know, back at my last demo, I doodled all of this stuff um, kind of just on the fly. And, you know, there's some topological uh, things going on in here. So there's some limited support for topology, but really the onboard mode is designed to allow you to quickly capture information into GIS. Um, using just rapid kind of draw and erase tools. So actually, so that it doesn't uh, freeze us again, I will turn off this live topology and just uh, just kind of draw a few things. You know, So this is at a much larger scale. We're drawing over the entire Appalachian Fold and Thrust Belt here, but um, it kind of still works uh, pretty well. So, so you can capture information at multiple scale. It kind of records some information about the width of the line you drew as a proxy for uncertainty and um, you know, allows you to just map really rapidly. Uh, so that's kind of the, the basics. You know, since this is open planetary lunch, the question uh, is begged basically, does this work on other planets? And the answer is, of course it does, because half of my PhD was uh, was working on Mars. And when I started creating this tool for mapping in Namibia, I instantly was like, oh, well, I could interpret Mars a lot better too. Even though my mapping process was much more tractable because I wasn't looking at this super fine scale of data, um, I was able to start thinking, oh, can I like reinterpret uh, my Mars mapping? So I made sure from the beginning that this supported mapping in arbitrary coordinate systems. Um, you know, and including things like uh, Certus Major, Transverse Mercator, which is what I was using, um, and uh, arbitrary imagery layers, uh, either on the device or kind of brought in from remotely. Um, and so just to kind of show that off really quick. So here's kind of the project picker screen, and I can go to this Certus Jezero project, which of course has Hi Mom from Jezero here, and then uh, you know, I can just doodle, doodle some other lines kind of on Jezero Crater. Um, I did a little work because um, the mapping library is kind of earth focused to make sure that the, the scale actually shows the correct width of, of Jezero Crater here. So it, it understands planetary radius, at least at a basic level. Um, and you know, you can also add some line types and, and do other things to kind of represent your mapping data as you need to. So that's kind of the basic system there. And one of the kind of 
unsung uh, results of this app, because this was like a really early version of the app that was used for this, is uh, my 2019 paper on uh, the upper stratigraphy of Northeast Sirtis Major Mars. Really, um, I drafted the mapping first in QGIS, and then I redrafted it entirely using this app over the course of a weekend. Um, and kind of refined some of the contacts, uh, you know, went to a new level of precision with uh, digitizing all of these box work fractures that you see at the bottom of the map. And that really was a, was a key data product. And I was able to knock it out really quickly um, at a high, high resolution by using kind of the tools that I've developed here. So, um, you know, this is definitely applicable to planetary mapping. Um, and one other thing to note is that the demo that I just showed you uses the exact same streaming base maps coming from the exact same server as my uh, Northeast Certus Major 3D viewer that, um, that I showed off last summer. And actually uh, this ability to stream multi-scale base maps is, is really uh, something that can drive multiple uh, multiple endpoints uh, for planetary GIS. And um, I'm actually kind of working on a PDARC proposal with a few other people to uh, build out capabilities to kind of drop imagery into a uh, server environment and have it exposed in a way that works for these web GIS uh, type of endpoints. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of uh, various people working in this kind of web GIS realm where we can all kind of share the same new technologies for base maps that will help uh, drive both of these types of products. So the second more complicated way to use this app, which is what I've used for the majority of my uh, mapping in Namibia and is really designed for you sitting outside of the field, kind of back in your office and, and developing a map, is basically tethering to your laptop or to a server somewhere that is running PostGIS, uh, which is a very powerful uh, spatial engine designed for many people to use it simultaneously and, and large scale data um, and tether to that. And basically then you can also tether to that same database with QGIS or ArcGIS and kind of see your map develop as you're building it. And so this is the mode that really enables um, large scale uh, drawing or working with a large scale map in this iOS app because the iPad doesn't really have quite the spatial capability to handle this large data set. Um, but it works pretty much the same as working with the smaller scale data sets in terms of the user experience. Um, and so this is really based on this open source map board server component that talks to PostGIS and talks to the map board app. Um, and then there is even another layer to this, which is uh, the tethered mapping mode with uh, topological solving. So that anemic topology engine we kind of uh, saw an example of on the um, spatialite side, there is a much more robust um, project that I've developed called PostGIS Geologic Map that actually um, works with a PostGIS database and solves the topology of a geologic map in real time. And um, one thing to emphasize with this is that it is designed in conjunction with Mapboard GIS, but it's totally separate. You could use it even if your um, preferred mapping platform was QGIS or some other uh, data input device, just as long as it saves to PostGIS, you can use uh, the topology solving capabilities. So um, these are two separate advances here. Um, and so this is just another, another GitHub uh, project with kind of a Node.js server component and lots of procedural SQL that was painful to write, but is really, really performant and functional. Um, and so just to kind of demo what my um, kind of fully realized uh, mapping process is, um, so I will go to this first project, which is called NowClick Remote. And basically this is loading lines from my remote post GIS database um, on the server in real time. And so we can kind of zoom around this 
this data view, we can zoom out a lot. It still takes a little bit to load the line work because um, there's just a lot of it. Um, but this will eventually do it, I hope. No, nope, it's getting it. So this is a view of my command line on the uh, computer that's basically showing um, what it's doing as it's loading the lines. Um, it's generating the tiles on the fly in PostGIS, which is part of why it's taking so long on the server. So now we're kind of actually getting the, the data loaded in. So this map is kind of a full, um, you know, uh, like 30,000 lines or something like that. Um, and then we can zoom in to a small area here. Um, and I kind of have a, uh, a client side app. So this is just running on my computer using the same data. Um, and we can find the same place on our, on our client side app here. And, and this is really nice because you can actually see the geology in 3D as you're working with it. Um, and so we can look at this little, uh, this little mountain here that, that we haven't set a unit for this, uh, the side of, of this, um, of this mesa, which is a few hundred meters wide. Um, and if I go back to my mapping app, um, we're kind of looking at that same place here. And what I can do is actually go into polygon mode, go to draw and say, what am I going to call this? This is lemon puts, uh, middle lemon puts. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw a polygon here to identify that unit. It shows up, and then it immediately snaps out to, um, to fill that area. Uh, and then if I go back to my, to my geologic map, which is complaining because it takes a lot of energy, should actually reload this eventually. You can see there's all of this uh, topological action going on on the server side. And then uh, the reloading doesn't work in, in Safari. But let me try changing a line a little bit. So I'll go into this reshape mode. Use bedrock contact. I guess I'm looking at the wrong thing. So let me try this again. Looking at the right thing. So I'm going to erase here, erase this feature. And then I'll redraw that line a little bit. Eventually, so this is going to refresh that it has my updates in there. Um, so, you know, this isn't, isn't super fast yet, but it works pretty quickly and you can kind of keep the map updating as you go. Um, and then combined with the 3D mapping side of things, um, you can actually, uh, pretty easily construct a geologic map um, while looking at your 3D data um, and uh, you know, basically get as, as broad of a view of a large area as you can um, and, and use that to inform your mapping. So this process basically has been uh, fully realized mostly on this one geologic map um, and then also a little bit on my Mars uh, Mars data, but I'm very interested in, in getting this out into the world so that others can use it. And so the next steps for this are a lot of performance fixes and optimizations. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sloppiness, especially on the on-device topology uh, that makes it kind of hard to use in the field. Um, there's a few things that Earthside geologists are clamoring for in terms of integrating with other systems for capturing point geologic data. There's a lot of apps for doing uh, field uh, structural measurements and the like that um, it would be nice to be able to see your measurements on the map as you're creating it. Um, you know, there's, there's some 
more fancy uh, GIS tools that that are nice to have, such as uh, healing the lines and and reshaping them and uh, kind of improving the line work as you go. Uh, that are tricky to get right and make it seamless for you to use. Um, you know, as kind of a hand drawing mode, um, and then. I guess it says public app store release here on next steps, but that is now checked off. So um, that is, uh, you know, things are coming along. And really what I'm hoping to do now is, um, well, first finish the Namibia map. Uh, that's the first priority because now I have the tools to do it. Um, then to basically publish this app and the, especially the iterative mapping workflow as a paper. Um, and then hopefully, um, either in conjunction with that effort or kind of uh, separate, uh, support other people in adopting either the topology solving or the um, or the map digitizing in the iPad app or both as part of their mapping workflows. So, um, you know, with that, I would say you should check out the app at mapboardgis.app. Um, and think about using that and also think about using the post GIS topology solver, which is becoming fairly robust and starting to be integrated with MacroStrat and other systems that I'm working on. Uh, think about how you could use that in your projects as well. So I'm happy to talk to anybody about, um, about whether this could be useful for their work. So uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you.